Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sandy Chu, and I'm an intellectual property attorney at Greenberg Charter LLP. I'm the immediate past president of the Asian Pacific American Bar Association of South Florida, and I am your moderator for today's program. We're thrilled to be presenting a timely webinar entitled Pandemic Technology Surveillance, Privacy Rights, Health Security, and the Undocumented. This panel is one of many in a series commemorating Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month and is sponsored by the ABA Section of Civil Rights and Social Justice and the Coalition on Racial and Ethnic Justice. We are actively planning additional programming on a variety of issues, so please visit AmericanBar.org slash CRSJ for updates on these programs. During today's program, we encourage you to ask questions of our panelists through the Q&A, not the chat function. If you do not see these controls, please ensure your screen is not idle. We will address these questions at the end of the program. We will be sharing a recording of this program to everyone who has registered so that you can share it widely with your networks. And with that, we are thrilled to bring you today's program, which is entitled Pandemic Technology Surveillance, Privacy Rights, Health Security, and the Undocumented. Our panelists today are Munji Gill, who's Senior Corporate Counsel, Employment and Compliance at Bang Energy, Shruti Reyna, Assistant Dean and Diversity Officer, Director of the International Law and Institutions Program, Professor of International Law Practice, and Class of 1963 Wells Program Professor at Indiana University Bloomington, and Michael E. Tiger, Professor Emeritus of, of Law at Duke University School of Law. Today, we will explore pandemic technology surveillance and the intersections of privacy rights health security, and the undocumented. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought heightened attention to the role of the state in protecting or failing to protect its people. Data collection and surveillance technology offer great promise for tracking and mitigating the spread of disease. However, no matter how such technologies advance our societies, they have often been misused and wielded as an instrument of state violence against marginalized communities, including undocumented people. This panel will explore the evolving dynamic between surveillance, protection, and state power, and the impact on immigrants and other marginalized communities during a pandemic. We will then explore privacy considerations currently existing on the state and federal levels and what is being done to ensure that our collected personal information remains private and out of the hands of bad actors. We will also explore the misuse and lack of legal controls on surveillance and how anti-immigrant government action has created a climate of fear and suspicion. Thank you for joining us today as we explore how we might balance rights and regulation to enhance public health and safety without exacerbating exclusion of communities. Our first speaker is Rudy Reyna. Professor Ron Reyna joined the Hamilton Luger School faculty in, 19, in 2017 focusing on international law and practice in human rights law. She's also the director of the International Law and Institutions Degree Program, which is a joint endeavor by Hamilton Luger School and Indiana University's Maurer School of Law. As, as assistant dean for curricular and undergraduate affairs at the fourth largest international affairs school in the US, Professor, Professor Reyna, works to develop and strengthen curricular offerings for undergraduate students and expand exp exper experiential and global learning opportunities. She is also the Hamilton Luger School's Diversity Officer in Overseas Recruitment, Professional Development, and Living Learning Center offices. She has a broad range of leadership and other experience in academia, legal practice, and international human rights organizations. Prior to coming to IU, she served as off counsel at Brooks Pierce LLP, where she helped grow the firm's international law practice, and has also practiced at Williams and Connolly LLP in Washington, D.C., and Quinn Emanuel LLP in San Francisco. She has previously served as a social affairs officer at the United Nations 
where she worked on international women's human rights issues and treaties. Prior to joining the Indiana University faculty, she was a professor at the University of Maryland's Law School, where she co-developed the school's international law clinic and was also a visiting professor at the UC Berkeley School of Law. As a member of the HLS faculty, Rena has led annual student delegations to the UN's Commission on the Status of Women and has worked with students and NGOs to produce and publish human rights reports. She's a frequent speaker and author on international and comparative law topics, including international women's rights, corporate social responsibility, business and technology regulation, and immigration and refugee law. She is active in her community, serving as a co-chair of the Indian chapter, an Indiana chapter of NAPOF, the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum, as a commissioner on the Bloomington Commission on the Status of Women, and has recently testified before lawmakers in, in Indiana and New York on legislation affecting reproductive health legislation in immigrant communities. She has also filed a number of Supreme Court and Federal Court amicus and merits briefs on immigration and refugee law issues. And now we will turn it to her. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction and also for inviting me to speak here today. I'm really looking forward to the discussion on this topic. So my focus today will be on understanding the dynamic between state action and inaction and how this intersects with surveillance to marginalize communities, especially non-citizens. And because of course, this is AAPI Heritage Month, in my discussion, I'd like to highlight the impact on AAPI immigrants in the US in particular. So my aim in presenting these ideas today is to provide a deeper understanding of the impact of surveillance on immigrant communities so that when we are designing public health and technology, technology responses, we can take these into account and implement more effective solutions. So um, to begin with, our moderator started off by framing the central tension that I think we're facing today in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. And that tension is that this global crisis has really highlighted how important the role of the state and government is in fighting a global threat that crosses territorial boundaries um, and in turn has led to calls for increased use of surveillance to combat this virus. But we know from our long history of such actions, we know how this dynamic plays out, right? First is that data collection often turns into tools for surveillance those tools for surveillance turn into weapons that can be used as instruments of state violence or at the very least to exclude or marginalize people from the larger community. So I'd like to discuss how we are seeing these dynamics play out right now in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic and what that means for how we should view state action, public health and technology design moving forward. Um, and I think you know there's some really interesting trends and paradoxes coming out of this current pandemic that I'd like to highlight. Okay, so one of the first things that we see is that the COVID-19 pandemic arrived as a global threat just at the moment that the international legal order, which was designed to support multilateral action and collaboration in response to threats, it arrived just as that international legal order was in grave danger. Um, as we experienced in the US, and over the last few years, a wave of populist leaders came to power around the world, right? Here in the United States, the United Kingdom, Brazil, Philippines, India, Hungary, Turkey, just to name a few around the world. Um, so what we saw was that these leaders were really dedicated to dismantling and withdrawing from the international legal order um, and doing so in the name of sovereignty, right? To reclaim their boundaries or their nations for the so-called you know, will of the people. So what I think is very important to point out, I know we've, we're all aware of this general trend of rising authoritarianism, populism and democratic backsliding. But one thing I wanna highlight is that as they withdrew from these treaties and institutions abroad, these leaders that I've just mentioned, they simultaneously also began to dismantle the protective apparatus of the state in their own countries, right? And by protective apparatus of the state, what I mean is the um, state apparatus that was meant to protect the vulnerable, such as healthcare systems, 
Um, so they dismantled those. At the same time, they accelerated the use of draconian controls on anyone who was deemed not a part of this populist nation, right? Not one of those people. We saw rising deportations, rising incarceration, all sorts of mechanisms of control. Um, and when I said apparatus of the state meant to protect the vulnerable, I think state um, or na national healthcare systems, whether they're nationalized or not, right, the healthcare system within a state or country, um, what we saw was that in these key um, countries, um, the US, Brazil, India, um, all of these countries, the leaders who came to power started by trying to dismantle the healthcare apparatus, right? So in the United States, um, soon after Trump came into office, one of the first things that he did was start to um, attempt to erode the ACA, right, to, to get rid of Obamacare. He didn't succeed in overturning it, but he definitely succeeded in wounding it. The same story played out in Brazil with Bolsonaro, with Modi in India, that they both went after the state health care systems um, at a period where we didn't have a pandemic, right? We, we knew at some, some point in time something like this would happen. Um, it's not surprising now that those are the very places where the pandemic has raged the most fiercely, right? The states that withdrew most deeply from the international system, and then at the same time turned on the protective apparatus within their own states by dismantling um, or wounding at least the healthcare system. Okay. So the COVID-19 pandemic arrived just when the tools for international cooperation were, um, as well as the tools for state action for the protection of health were wobbling. So then we see something really interesting that happened. As lawyers, we're used to dealing with state action and overreach, right? We spend a great deal of time and energy thinking about how to circumscribe and regulate state action upon individuals. Um, during this pandemic, however, something very different happened in the United States and these countries that I've mentioned. And that is that the pandemic response, both globally um, in terms of multilateral cooperation, but also nationally within countries like the US was characterized by inaction, not by state action, but by inaction. So we basically ended up having a global and a national leadership vacuum, right? We saw that in the United States, that there was denial, that there was even a pandemic, denial that it was a problem, denial that we needed to do anything about it, all ended up with the same result, lack of action, right? Lack of action on the part of the government. And here's where I think understanding the role of state dynamic, uh, sorry, the role of state surveillance and the dynamics of exclusion can help us understand what happened and how we might move forward in a more effective manner. So um, I wanna talk a little bit about what state surveillance means to different groups, because I think it can mean a lot of things, but I think there's interesting ways it was playing out in the pandemic. Okay, so if we think back to our um, populist leaders, again, I'm gonna pick on Trump, Bolsonaro, and now I'll put in Boris Johnson from the UK. Um, they had a very different view of what surveillance meant, right? So they were very of show, wary of showing any vulnerability from themselves and prioritize these sort of highly masculinized and nationalistic views of strength. Um, so they were intent on flouting public health surveillance, right? Flouting public health expertise, um, deriding public health mechanisms like masks and social distancing. Um, and then at the same time, refusing to deploy state power to protect their populations against the virus, right? Um, we know that there were so many missed opportunities to protect um, the US population that were missed. Um, and what was the justification for that? These leaders called those forms of surveillance, right? Wearing a mask is forcing me to do things, telling me I have to wear a mask before I enter a place of worship or a store or something like that is a form of um, impringing on my freedom, surveilling what I do. So these leaders, what we saw during the pandemic is that they exploited and flipped the paradigms of positive and negative rights, right? They privileged um, what I'm gonna say is the freedom to infect over the right to protection from harm. And there I'm quoting Ibrahim Kendi's description, right? Of this dynamic between freedom to some is the freedom to infect without consequence to others, freedom is the protection from harm. Um, 
In contrast, we saw in nations where populism was less strong and democracy had been weakened less severely, that um, these nations did really well in fighting the pandemic, right? New Zealand, Germany, Taiwan, Iceland, um, they were, they've been lauded for their, you know, deserved success in combating the virus as they sought to foster a sense of inter interdependence, trust, and shared purpose in mobilizing state resources to protect the health and safety of their populations. So what does this mean, again, in terms of surveillance? I think these contrasts between the nations that um, did nothing, right, that, that I'm calling state action to protect their people versus the nations that did something to protect their people, right, then they had the flip side, the ones that did nothing to protect, um, did nothing to prevent people from infecting, right, or, or very little to prevent this. Okay, so these contracts highlights how state inaction appears to be operating as a mechanism to neutralize obligations for positive action, right, simply doing nothing during a crisis favors the status quo and exacerbates inequalities. So as you know, if we look at feminist and critical scholars, um, they've long noted that state inaction is not a neutral act, but it sharpens divides, right? In a crisis like a pandemic, um, inaction means that you are misallocating sources, you're not investing in solutions, you are um, ignoring people's positive rights and interests and in enjoying safety, security, or, you know, other, um, other forms of well-being. Um, and you're doing so in a way, again, doing nothing means the people who already have resources can take action on their own. The people who are most vulnerable, already marginalized, are the ones who bear the brunt of this um, of this consequence, and we saw that playing out in our pandemic, right? In the United States, we know that the bulk of the health effects, financial effects, um, you know, rising hate crimes, all of these landed on the most marginal, already most marginalized communities in the U.S. Um, if we look at um, race, gender, and economics. So the other part of this that is important is that this creates a cycle. It's not just state inaction or action that um, you know, ends up with um, an uneven result. What it is is that it starts, it triggers a cycle, right? State inaction diminishes and erodes public trust, right? We, we all trust the government less when we know they're not doing anything to protect us. Um, that in turn diminishes state capacity. If you lack public trust, you have less power to do anything to affect your communities. And that further deepens the crisis, right? You start this sort of negative cycle. So international lawyers, I think, are looking at this situation and they're trying to understand this dynamic and trying to understand why it is that states failed to act in this situation. Um, but what I think is interesting for our perspective today, given the nature of what we're focusing on, is that we get to look at an area where this dynamic was flipped, right? So it might be that the US, the UK, all these different countries took very little action to protect their population, but where did they, they enhance and exacerbate state action? It was to target and stigmatize and deport or strip rights from immigrants, from non-citizens, from women, um, from groups that were vulnerable because they needed health care, right? Again, who's bearing the brunt of what's going on in, um, in this pandemic? And as I said, um, this is our chance, you know, given the topic that we're looking at today to really focus in on what that means. Okay, so what is, what is, what is this reveal about the dynamics between state power, state violence, and exclusion or inclusion? What does it mean to be part of this nation, especially a populist nation, right? So let's go back to this idea of um, what freedom means, right? For some people, freedom um, in terms of rights means freedom from regulation, right? As I said before, the right to infect without consequences. For others, it means freedom from violence and um, power being exerted against you, right? Or power dynamics being exerted against you. As an immigrant, as a woman who needs health care, you're always going to be on the short end of the stick for, um, in terms of these dynamics. But in addition to sort of um, being in, you know, this imbalance of power, there's a critical link, I think, between state power and surveillance here when you when it comes to health care, and that's the situation that. Um, healthcare, I think, really highlights this particular dynamic. You need healthcare in order to fully participate in society, right? Whether it's to leave your house during a pandemic or, um, you know, 
go to school, go to work, you know, do, do anything. If you, if you, you know, you, you need healthcare to you, or you need to be, you know, some level of um, being able to access the outside community, right? Um, so in order to get healthcare, you have to provide and receive information to get it. Either leaving your house or online, you have to provide information to someone and receive information to get healthcare. So this gives a key entry point that is the point at which information is shared, right? Between the person who needs healthcare and the person who is providing it. If you can get to that dynamic and either stigmatize or cut off that entry point where the person needs to either provide information or get information back from their provider, then that means you're pushing them out of the community, right? If you're putting somebody in a situation where they can't share that information either freely or you know, without being under threat, then you've managed to push them out of the community, right? That's exactly the point of honing in on this link where you have to provide information and either stigmatizing or regulating this. And this fits in, as I'll, I'll note, um, really well um, or unfortunately well with, with the populist project, right? Or sort of exacerbating this power dynamics. Um, okay, so I wanna just give briefly three examples which show how this dynamic is operating. Um, I think Michael will speak more about this, but we saw um, attempts to make the public charge rule even harsher leading up to the pandemic, right? Which left people in a worse situation, right? So this was um, a rule that said people or immigrants in particular would be cut off from receiving public benefits for various reasons. During the Trump years, this rule was they tried to expand it to basically anybody who was an immigrant or, or not a permanent resident wouldn't be able to access state health care um, if, if they couldn't show that they were um, an American citizen. So what did this do? It disproportionately impacted, um, obviously, not just immigrant families, but it disproportionately impacted women and children. Right, um, American citizen children are entitled to various forms of health care and immunizations and things like that. If their parents can't take them to the doctor, those children can't get it. Um, it, und it was aimed at and undermined um, access to health care, right? Um, the link between providing information, right? The point at which you have to provide information in order to get health care, that's where the public charge rule tried to perpetuate false and harmful stereotypes of immigrants and women, right? Particularly immigrant women and children of color as burdens on the state, right? Again, to make sure to push them out of the community, um, reduce their access to these sort of to these public goods, you know, at, you know, which puts all of us at risk, right? We're all at risk if vaccinations are low, if somebody is sick and doesn't get health care. Um, and, um, you know, the public charge rule specifically targeted access to health care and health insurance. And again, the most vulnerable, right? Uh, programs for pregnant or breast breastfeeding women, programs for infants and children. Um, so we can see how this dynamic is playing out. Um, the second example um, accelerated during the pandemic. Um, the pandemic basically provided new, new ways of surveilling women who needed reproductive health care, right? So the story of abortion and birth control and other reproductive health access over the last decades is to put as many barriers in people's way to accessing it, try to stop them as much as possible. Um, so all of a sudden, these states that were saying, we're not gonna do any pandemic response, we're not gonna force people to wear masks, we're not going to close our schools or other places where, you know, groups mingle. We're not going to um, socially distance. We're not going to do all of this stuff. But, at the, but suddenly what we're going to do is say it's such a big risk to access a doctor during the pandemic that we're going to ban um, access to abortions or other reproductive health care, right? We're going to say it's so dangerous for you to leave your house right now that you can't go to a doctor, even though we're also saying for everybody else, everybody else has the freedom to infect. They don't, we're not implementing any other rules. So we saw a number of states, including Indiana, where I live now, attempt to put a ban on um, women accessing uh, places like Planned Parenthood, any place where they could get reproductive health and banning access to abortions, where of course, if you delay it, it means it can't happen, right? Um, and this sort of escalated as we're fighting about masks and simple social distancing. Meanwhile, and the Supreme Court is like saying we can't put restrictions on churches or houses of worship in terms of gatherings of people. At the same time in January of this year, the Supreme Court, their very first abortion decision was um, doubling down on these cases that said, 
um, you can't get abortion pills without going to a provider, right? You have to, you can't get, um, you know, you can't get these, um, this medication by mail. You can get lots of other medication by mail. You can do a telehealth for every single other thing. You can't do it if you need reproductive health care. If you need these pills, you have to go get them in person. They can't be brought to your house. Um, and, um, and the Supreme Court upheld that, right? You can't let a church limit and you know limit the number of people gathering and whether they're wearing masks and all this kind of stuff but you can say that women can't again access these points of health care um without um you know dur during this dur during this time period the last example is um um hate crimes we all know that there's been a surge in um anti-asian hate crimes among others during the pandemic um, and surveillance efforts um, that I think you know our other panelists will speak more about limits that has limited the willingness of communities to work with government agencies or anyone they perceive as having enforcement power like police um, to address or report um, hate crimes, right? Um, during the pandemic, um, I'm gonna include gender-based violence um, and domestic violence as a hate crime, right? Um, that's something we know um, we think rates of domestic violence um, during the pandemic rose by 30 to 50% um, worldwide and in the United States. Um, and, um, you know, all of a sudden abusers had this new tool which they could prevent people from accessing help. The same tool that states used, right, to prevent women from accessing reproductive health care um, was to say you, you can't get access to these people who, who can help you. Okay, going back to what I was talking about um, I just want to relate it back to the big picture that I mentioned when I started out about this idea of state action and inaction and what exactly is going on, how that relates to inclusion. Um, when, we, um, when we think about what populism means, right, um, the populism all over the world has been characterized by dismantling gatekeepers, by saying we need to channel the win win will of the people straight up to the top by getting rid of experts, by getting rid of all these people who are gatekeepers. Gate gatekeepers include doctors, right? Gatekeepers include people to, who help people access health care. So what we're trying to say is, or what I think is happening is that, um, um, that in this sort of environment, the gatekeepers who prevent certain groups of people within the nation from doing whatever they want, those are eliminated. The gatekeepers who prevent people from joining the community, from being included in the community, the gatekeepers who have the power and authority to push people out of the community are the ones who are um, hardened, supported, built up, given more power um, during this time. That tells us exactly who is meant to be included in the nation or the people or the people who should be protected and who is not. So I think those are really important things to think about as we move forward and think about how to emerge from the pandemic and most um, effectively use public health tools. Um, I think we need to understand the role of gatekeepers, how it relates to these larger ideas of power and state power and how it should be used. Um, understanding the role of gatekeepers, the threats they could pose and how they can be used to exclude and not protect, right? Understanding that freedom for some is the freedom to infect without regulation, while for other, it's the others, it's the freedom gained from regulation that protects a community from harm. So I will end there and turn it back to our moderator. But as I said, again, I'm really looking forward to hearing your questions and hearing more about this discussion. So thank you. Thank you, Shudi. Um, that was very informative and very comprehensive um, and very um, important for helping us understand um, the evolving dynamic between surveillance, protection, and state power, and how this has affected um, access and impact to public health and safety. So thank you. Um, our, our next speaker is Manjeet Gill. He's going to speak about privacy and IP considerations. He serves as senior corporate counsel with a, with a leading nutritional and dietary supplement and energy beverage manufacturer poised for global ascendance. His responsibilities are diverse with the, within the legal function, including labor and employment, transactional and litigation support, as well as regulatory and compliance. Previously, he served as an outside legal and business counselor, helping clients both in the U.S. and abroad to maximize their business potential by navigating the unique channels created by varying corporate, international, and intellectual property law regimes and leveraging relationships to help clients identify and capitalize new business opportunities and revenue streams, and ensuring clients 
engage in international activities are in full compliance of applicable laws, including Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and the rulings from the Office of Foreign Assets Control. He has represented several clients as outside general counsel in a cannabis, hemp, and CBD space. He's handled matters from compliance to capital raising to IP portfolio development and licensing to contract negotiation. In addition, he represented clients in the formation of opportunity zone funds for both real estate sector and other business sectors. And now we're going to hear from Manjit. Thank you, Sandy. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, obviously, I come from a slightly different perspective than our other two panelists in terms of the decided commercial uh, background that, that I've had from, from the outset. But I, I still think there is something that uh, hopefully I'll, I'll be, a, in a, be able to be an effective bridge in the conversation we're having today from what Truthy has already uh, shared with us and that what Michael is going to conclude. You know, obviously, as we're talking about the issues that we're all facing, uh, confronting the pandemic, one of the aspects that we face, even in our setting, in, in a commercial setting, is how do we contend with the fact that we're collecting information, personal information, from lots of different folks in lots of different avenues. I mean, historically, we would collect information the, the old-fashioned way. Uh, you know, we've collected in person. That's still part of what a lot of us end up doing uh, in our various capacities. But as time has gone on in the increasingly digital landscape that we all are a part of, uh, you know, the, the scale at which we're collecting personal information, uh, it literally is growing leaps and bounds you know, by, the, by the minute. And so I just, what I really was hoping to do for the, uh, the audience today is, is to give that kind of context of where we have been historically when it comes to privacy law here in the U.S. and where I think we're headed and how that plays into how we're going to, you know, look at making sure that we're protecting the interests of everybody as information is getting collected. And as I mentioned, in, in, our, in our my own context with, with the company for whom I work, we're a very directly people facing company. We make goods that are consumed. And in order to do that, you know, part of it is, you know, we've got distributors. So, you know, they're out in the, in, in the marketplace. And then we also have e-commerce channels. So as part of that goes, we're collecting information all the time. Uh, you know, when you place an order with us, you're necessarily going to give us some personal information. And, you know, so, so obviously they're, 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 that's one source of information that we gather. Another aspect for a company like ours is that in, in terms of be, being able to grow our revenue, a lot of it's tied into promotions, marketing. I mean, that, that's the lifeblood of companies in the consumer space. And as part of that, historically, you know, a lot of that marketing would have been uh, strictly in person, even for our company, as we've confronted, uh, you know, the issues with the pandemic, uh, we basically expanded our efforts in the digital stream in terms of marketing. So, but by doing so, whether it's us, uh, you know, having various social media posts out there, but more importantly, with promotions, you know, where we're in, trying to encourage our customers and potential customers to, you know, get to know more about us, about the products we have, and, you know, whether we're going to run a sweepstake or, or some other promotion, as part of that, we're gathering information all the time. And, you know, with that information, uh, again, you know, there is an expectation and an understandable expectation from the, the folks who give us that information that that information is, is not going to be ending up in the wrong hands. You know, that when they um, make that commitment to provide us the information, that we're going to do everything in our power to, to make sure that it, it, it stays secure. And, and, and that's something for us in the commercial setting that uh, it's a tenant where, where we live by, you know, every single day. And, you know, against that backdrop, you know, the, the, the other issue I would say that's interesting for all of us is that privacy, privacy law, at least here in the U.S., I mean, I, I could go on forever even talking about globally, even for our company, we confront the vagaries of privacy law around the world because we have operations, we sell our products in other parts of the world. But just for our purposes, just looking at the U.S., it's an interesting dynamic that we're, we're facing that, as I mentioned, it's continuing to evolve. You know, when it, you know, when it comes at the federal level, 
you know, in a perfect world that we don't live in, there would be one standard federal privacy law that would govern every interaction uh, between all of us. And, and you know, and, and that would be it. We're not there yet. We're, I don't think we're even close to that. Um, and, and instead, at the federal level, uh, what we're really confronting is, at this point, a few different laws that have been on the books uh, and then with implementing regulations for varying periods of time. Uh, and, and with that, what those laws tend to do when it comes to privacy is that for discrete types of transactions, the law provides that, okay, when, when it comes to, let's say in the financial sector, you know, if you're collecting information about individuals, you know, th there is an expectation that you're going to have to do certain things to protect the sanctity of that information. And then tied to it, making sure that you're engaged in collecting information in a way that you minimize the collection of information, meaning essentially only collect what you absolutely positively need to collect to, to allow that transaction to take place, to allow that service to be provided. And, you know, so that, that's one part. And then, of course, as Shruti uh, rightly uh, mentioned in her presentation, another key area which is important at the federal level when it comes to data collection and the protection of data relates to the healthcare sector. Um, obviously, with HIPAA, a law that we've all uh, been, you know, uh, exposed to uh, in, in varying degrees, that's, that's one of the probably the most important areas that, uh, from a privacy standpoint, making sure that the information that we all have, personal information about, you know, our our medical histories, the treatments that we're, you know, having to, in, you know, get get done or and whatnot, that that information is kept, uh, you know, at, as limited in terms of who has access to it as possible. And I, I can say it's the interesting aspect that we face as a company uh, with with a very diverse workforce. We've got, you know, in excess of 1,500 employees around the country. And even as we, you know, ha we're dealing with the issues of confronting the pandemic and making sure that, you know, for, for different employees that might have been having uh, issues that came within the scope of, uh, of COVID, making sure that that information was kept, you know, in, in a manner that we even minimized who within our company would have access to that information. I mean, you know, so, so the, the point being that, uh, you know, obviously, a, as we're in a scenario where more and more people, you know, are, uh, you know, operating, uh, you know, away from their workplace and, and you know, information is getting transmitted digitally, that in that context, you, you've got to be that much more careful about how that information is being handled. And in, in, in another area, I would say that, you know, touches on that, as, as, you know, at the federal level at this point, is that, when we're talking about government actors, what's interesting is that we have an act, the U.S. Privacy Act, you know, that was enacted back in 1974, you know, that's that's on the books. That uh, it, it's interesting that at the federal level we have that act that ostensibly says that when it comes to information collected by government agencies, that there's an obligation, you know, to protect the privacy of that information in terms of how it's handled, if there's a scope to correct the information and, and so forth. But that, that, that has strictly been done at, as it relates to the government entities. And for whatever reason so far, it hasn't extended to trying to impose at the federal level, you know, a, a sort of a, a, a you know, a, a pan-national approach that would even cover, uh, you know, private sector actors. And that's hopefully where we're going to be headed. Until that happens, though, what we're instead faced with at, is a, I mean, for lack of a better word, sort of a hodgepodge of state laws. Right now at the state level, when it comes to privacy, pretty much all the states have laws on the books that are, a, address, you know, if, if a data breach occurs in, in terms of making sure that, you know, the appropriate people are notified that, hey, your data was compromised or what have you, but that, that's like basically the, the the tip of the iceberg. There's still much more that needs to be done. And at this point, really, we're at the state level, we're, we only have a handful of states, California leading the way, that's made a more concerted effort, you know, to, to say, well, when it comes to the data out there about you, uh, we, we really need to have laws that are very, very 
detailed in terms of spelling out what your rights are from the outset and making sure not only that they spell out what your rights are, but how you're able to exercise those rights and make sure that if there is uh, inf information value has gotten the wrong hands, how to address it and things like that. But, uh, you know, I, I, that's sort of the context of, of where we're at right now overall with this. Thank you. Thank you, Manjeet, for the privacy overview and helping us understand how this all intersects. Um, our next speaker is Michael Tiger. He will speak about surveillance and undocumented people. He was an associate and partner at Williams & Connolly and a partner in his own firm, Tiger & Buffon. Since 1996, he has been associated in law practice with his wife, Jane B. Tiger. He has been acting professor of law at, U at UCLA. He's been the Joseph D. Jamail Chair in Law at the University of Texas and, hold and a holder of an endowed professorship at University College at Washington College of Law, where he is professor emeritus. He has been on the law faculty at Aix de Provence. He is an author and editor of more than a dozen books, including Thinking About Terrorism, The Threat to Civil Liberties, in Times of National Emergency, Fighting Injustice, Examining Witnesses, and persu Persuasion, The Litigator's Art, and The Law and the Rise of Capitalism. He has also written three plays and dozens of law review articles. In his law practice, Professor Tiger has represented the Washington Post, John Connolly, Senator Kay Bailey Hutchinson, Scott McClellan, Representative Ronald Dellums, Mobile Oil, Fernandez Chavez, Lynn Stewart, and Terry Lynn Nichols. He has tried cases in many courts across the country and argued seven cases in the U.S. Supreme Court and dozens of federal appeals. He also, he also um, I learned that he released his memoir um, last month, Sensing Injustice, A Lawyer's Life in the Battle for Change. Professor Tiger was chair of the ABA section of litigation um, from 1989 to 90, and he is a visiting professor at Duke um, 2006 to seven and seven to eight. And now we'll have Professor Tiger. Thank you for that generous introduction. Oh, you'd think with all of that, I could figure out how to unmute my microphone. Um, I would like to provide a context. I mean, here we are. One morning we woke up, uh, I think around 2010 or so, and said, at last, we have a government that listens to us. And we discovered just how extensively they were listening to us. But I want to put this into some kind of context because of the month that it is. We're dealing with um, Asian and Pacific Islands people. Because what unites the themes that we're talking about today? The unbridled surveillance and the marginalization of undocumented immigrants. The roots of all of these, I want to suggest, is a kind of pandemic of its own, a kind of historically rooted racism born at the moment that the United States was born and nurtured from the foundation of the nation. On July 15, 1960, John F. Kennedy accepted the Democratic nomination for president of the United States, and he said, I stand tonight facing west on what was once the last frontier. From the lands that stretched 3,000 miles behind me, the pioneers of old gave up their safety, their comfort, and sometimes their lives to build a new world here in the West. They were determined to make that new world strong and free and to conquer the enemies that threatened from without and within. That was 1960, and all across the United States, children had the box of 64 Crayola crayons. And in their box of 64 Crayola crayons was one called flesh. And guess what color that was? It was a kind of a peach color. This is six years after Brown versus the Board of Education. And yet Binney and Smith, the makers of Crayola crayons, couldn't think of anything to do other than call that crayon flesh. Uh, my point is this, and at the very time that John Kennedy was speaking, the United States was preparing uh, slowly to be sure at first to enter into the conflict in Vietnam. The United States had latterly formed the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, 
uh, on the pretense under the UN Charter that the United States was part of the Southeast Asian region. And so it was a regional alliance. That one still has the map makers scratching their heads as they attempt to put the United States into the Southeast Asian region. And of course, this is a part of a long history that we sometimes overlook in our to be sure justifiable concern with the institution of slavery. And that is the thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of Chinese who perished in the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad, the Japanese incarceration, the recollection that the very first equal protection case decided by the Supreme Court was about Chinese laundry owners. That's Yikwul versus Hopkins, 118 US 356. And so some of this history of which I speak can be found in Roxanne Dunbar's book, The Indigenous People's History of the United States, and in David Vine's wonderful new book, The United States of War. Now for the past 30 years, to bring it down to the present, we have these wars in the Middle East. Again, the guns are turned on people of color. And within the United States, the attention turns with discriminatory intent and effect against people of color and, and Muslim Americans. So we ask ourselves, what can we do about this? What is it that we confront here? Because when the state acts in the ways that I have described, it covers it up by invoking the mantra of national security. After all, they're just protecting us. Now the mantra of national security has already shown its malign effects as we lawyers prepare to enter the battles and find that the tools that we are accustomed to use may not work as well as we had hoped. For example, and I put into the chat the wonderful book by Jacobus Tenbrook, Barnhart and Matson, Prejudice, War and the Constitution. We look, for example, at the Korematsu and Hirabayashi cases upholding the Japanese incarceration. Those cases were based on a lie told by the Solicitor General of the United States to the United States Supreme Court about the supposed, but in fact, non-existent danger posed by Japanese and Japanese Americans in the United States. And then we look a little further on to a case called Reynolds versus United States, 345 US 1. That involved a crash of an Air Force plane and Mrs. Reynolds, whose husband was killed, was denied a remedy because the government convinced the Supreme Court that state secrets would be involved if the downing, if why that plane crashed was somehow revealed. Forty years later, it turned out the government had lied to the Supreme Court that time too and that it was a routine mechanical malfunction used simply to get Mrs. Reynolds out of court. Well, all of this is coming to, uh, to the Supreme Court of the United States, coming to a Supreme Court near you. Um, and that's a case called United States versus Hussein, H-U-S-A-Y-N. I put the cert op and the information about it in the chat. Hussein was a, a, rend was a rendition victim taken to various black sites and tortured. Now, a part of his torture was accomplished with the assistance of mental health personnel, that is healthcare people, recruited by the CIA to devise ways in which to break the will of those under interrogation. Quite reasonably, uh, Mr. Hussein would like to, to have some sort of a remedy for that. The Ninth Circuit held that the district judge should look at the invocation of state secrets privilege to protect the CIA's interrogation techniques and decide what could be produced to the plaintiff and what could not, what would remain secret. Uh, the government sought and obtained certiorari and the certiorari petition makes the amazing assertion that the district judge improperly substituted his judgment for that of the CIA about what should remain secret. Um, it is as though somebody delivered a copy of the Constitution to the CIA, but they left Article 3 out of it so that the judges wouldn't really have anything to say about this sort of thing. And that we hope the court will recognize is an insult to the very fundamental ideas that the framers had. The framers loved the idea of Montesquieu's notion of separation of powers. And it was Montesquieu, Montesquieu who said that as soon as the executive branch gains unreviewable authority to do things, quote, that will be the end of everything. And so we look, when we look at this issue, 
we have to ask ourselves, where is it that we can start? Back in 2012, and I think we put up an article I wrote in 2014, uh, the end of separation of powers. And if not, we'll make sure we do afterwards. The Congress held hearings into CIA surveillance techniques and into these questions of renditions and tortures and so on. And once again, the CIA and the other agencies did everything they could to prevent the truth from coming out. And now as people bring cases like the one I just mentioned or about drone strikes, we are met with these invocations of state secrets privilege, blunting the tools that we are accustomed to use. And so what ought we to do? As lawyers, we should courageously take these cases and demand that the Supreme Court live up to what it said. That is to say that the judicial control of evidence should not be abandoned to the caprice of the executive branch. And the second thing we need to do is to get at what uh, the previous speaker was talking about. That is to begin to define in a time of pandemic surveillance, what the right of privacy has come to mean in practical terms. Because as a practical matter, all you know, teenagers out there all across the country are putting up stuff on social media <laughs> that can be retailed all over the place and their right to privacy is simply disappearing. And if you doubt that that's the case, talk to any lawyer who's retained in a case and wants to start investigating the potential witnesses on the other side, what's the first place they go? Um, is what the government has said in the articles that I have cited is that because this massive surveillance is not directed at the immediate bringing of a criminal case, that therefore the Fourth Amendment is not implicated. That is a nonsensical provision, it seems to me. We cannot permit the decoupling of the Fourth Amendment protections of privacy right, such as they are, from ordinary rights of people. That is to say, cannot make them something that's invoked only in the case the government brings a, uh, a criminal case against somebody. And as so I want to suggest something for all for the and maybe a law student could write a comment about this. OK, so here, here, here goes your comment suggestion. Uh, take a look at Ruckel's House versus Monsanto. Now, that was a case under the uh, Insecticide, Fungicide and Rodenticide Act. Um, there you go. And Monsanto was required as a maker of a fungicide, rodenticide, insecticide, there I managed to say it twice, um, to supply information about the chemical composition of its product. And it resisted that because it turned out that once you'd filed it with the federal government, their other investigators further on might be able to gain access to it. And that would give them access to Monsanto's trade secrets. And therefore the forced disclosure was regarded as a taking within the meaning of the Fifth Amendment. Now that's a very that's an interesting idea. Um, is the taking of information about your private life, your existence, your views, what book to check out of the library? Do we have a property right in those individual attributes such that government could be restrained from taking it and using it? Um, it is an idea that's been tried in various forms, but I think is worthy of further study. Because one thing we know about the right of property is that it's no, it is a notion that has progressively expanded across from copyright and patent onto this much fuzzier thing about trade secrets. And in that process, you might look back to a 19th century case called Prince Philip versus Strange. Because it turns out that Queen Victoria and her husband, Prince Philip, used to sit up in Windsor Castle or wherever it was and make etchings. And uh, after, and it turned out that, that, of course, as always happens, somebody got hold of these etching plates, which were, of course, very valuable, and uh, started selling them to the public. And the British courts held that their majesties had something like a property right in the 
what was contained, not just in the physical thing called the copper plates, but in, in the images and likeness, a concept that has been explored in greater length in parts or in decisions uh, across the United States. Another thing that I want to suggest to the lawyers here is something that happened in this Hussein case that I've mentioned that's now in the Supreme Court. That case was also litigated in the European Court of Human Rights. It was litigated there because he was moved around uh, to rendition sites, black sites, that were within the European Union and therefore were in states that are signatories to the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, now, it may seem that what I'm talking about here is a little bit distant from these ideas about which you've been speaking, but I suggest not. I suggest that it is our job to, for, to take control of the kinds of information that government obtains from people and the uses to which it is put. Um, and if there are any questions about that, or if you doubt uh, the wisdom or relevance of what I've said, I'm sure you'll tell me in the question part. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all panelists for very insightful um, remarks and for um, providing a lot of um, analysis and review about, um, about the topic. Uh, we have received um, some questions. Um, the first question um, for anyone with respect to international identity theft um, and personal data loss, um, whose responsibility is it? Is it just um, private citizens or is there someone that we can turn to if there's a governmental agency um, who can help, help us in, in the event that someone um, is experiencing identity theft? Well, I, I mean, I'll, I'll speak on that. I mean, from the context, again, partly a commercial setting is that you know, even for us, when we've had instances where, you know, uh, customers or others who interfaced with us and have provided information, and there have been some limited instances where information uh, ended up getting uh, released, uh, typically what the, what the process has been, and, and no doubt it, it, it's consistent in other parts of the world, is that we have an obligation as a company that collects information that once we're made aware of a potential uh, breach, a uh, potential uh, loss of information or dissemination of personal information uh, to somebody who, you know, we, we never uh, agreed that they would have access to it. There are relevant uh, state actors that we have an obligation to advise, whether let's say in a given state of California, California Attorney General, if it's a California resident, as an example. And even for us, for example, we have operations in Canada and we have a uh, you know, separate uh, website governing our operations there. And if we collect information, same thing happens where uh, information uh, you know, get, gets in the wrong hands. We have an obligation to advise the relevant uh, agencies within uh, Canada of the same thing that, you know, A, that we've learned about it and B, what are the steps that we've taken to uh, correct it, remedy it as best we can. I mean, it, 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 I, I would say the key thing that, you know, from a commercial standpoint is you have to have uh, a mechanism in place to be proactive about it. As soon as one in the un, hopefully <laughs> very limited circumstance where something happens like this, that you're not sort of waiting to hear from the, you know, the governmental entity. You've got to be proactive and let them know this is what, based on our, on our own internal efforts, you know, we clearly have evidence that something may have uh, gotten out and we're letting you know it's happened and this is what we're doing to correct it. Okay, um, we have another question. Um, within the context of increasing surveillance, how shall we view the policy of increasing the gathering of biometric information, um, more than just a fingerprint, of immigrants at the border and when they apply for immigrant immigration benefits? What are the threats associated with this and how should we fight against this? Uh, um, the, uh, the, just, the, at the borders of the United States, the government has certain powers with respect to invasion of privacy that it does not possess once you get a couple of hundred miles in. Uh, 
And therefore, any effort to restrict information collection at the border runs into that barrier. However, uh, and somebody's going to want a citation to a case in here, but good luck on that because my memory is not what it used to be. Um, if you have a right to enter into the United States as a, as a refugee or a person seeking asylum, you can argue that it is unconstitutional, it violates the Constitution to condition the exercise of that right on your giving up the ordinary protections of privacy that you would say are enshrined in the constitution or statutes. That idea of so-called unconstitutional conditions uh, has not fared so well in the Supreme Court's decisions of late as it did once upon a time when uh, Justice Brennan was there, but it was cited with approval in a case, and you're just gonna have to look this up on Google because I can't remember it, called Lefkowitz versus Cunningham, um, which, um, I, I, which I'm ashamed to say I can't remember the site because I argued it back in 1976. It's a relevant by analogy. And I'd just like to add to that. I think that was, you know, obviously the, a comprehensive description of sort of what we're facing at the border. Um, but aside from the legal precedents, which are really difficult to get around, right, as, as we know, um, if we think about this a little bit more broadly, right, the point that I always try to make about immigration law when I'm speaking to you, mixed audiences of international and domestic lawyers, right, is that when you flout your um, obligations under international refugee law or asylum principles or human rights, you're actually breaking your own law, right? Because we've domesticated, we've incorporated, inter, you know, the international refugee protection norms into, you know, the U.S. statutory code, la statutory language. And so when you start um, using these national security justifications and all of these to flout your international obligations, to flout your obligations under asylum laws, you're weakening and breaking ultimately US law. And um, who's to say that you can't use those precedents from the border against um, you know, people in the interior of the United States who have nothing to do with the asylum process? Right? We know that that's how law works, right? You borrow precedents from one area and apply them in others. And often they're stripped of their context when they're taken from one case and cited in another. And so I think that's, um, we need to be aware of that dangerous sort of leakage, right? You might think you can isolate a lot of these human rights violations at the border, but you're never gonna be able to do that, right? It's going to, um, they're going to prop, prop, prop up in other cases. They might be used against non-citizens at the border, but they're gonna be used against citizens later on. I'd, I'd like to add to that, if, if I may, that's a very, very wise comment, it seems to me. I mean, that's, that strikes at the heart of it. United States law, which includes, by the way, treaties to which the United States is a party and principles of customary international law provides robust protection for the rights of undocumented people and people presenting themselves at the border. It was the scandal of the Trump administration to refuse to obey laws passed by Congress with respect to admission at the border. So if you wanted to look up to follow that idea down, which is a very powerful one, um, United States District Judge John Tiger, that's spelled T-I-G-A-R, um, held that the Trump administration's limitations on entry into the United States were unlawful as a matter of United States law, as a matter because they violated these rather robust protections. Now, the Ninth Circuit didn't entirely go along with that, and there were these appeals, but uh, Judge Tiger, that's not me, that's it's my son, John, J-O-N, um, did write these opinions that you can look up on, uh, on Westlaw that carry forward this idea that we're not talking about matters of grace here. We're talking about a long tradition uh, developed at some cost and difficulty of the rights of people who are seeking refuge in the United States. Do we have any other questions? I saw a question later on that I think 
was directed to, to my, sorry, earlier on that I think was directed to my section. Um, and I briefly answered it, but I can answer it for the group. Um, so we have, we have a question. I understand that the distinction between inaction and state action, but isn't inaction a form of action such that it is indeed state action? And that this isn't a criticism, but an observation that the effects are one and the same. And I was just going to say that I completely agree with that. In my answer, I said that inaction and action, positive rights, negative rights, they're flip sides of the same coin, which is power, right? And how power is wielded. Um, and the point I want to make, though, is that while both action and inaction are sites of power, in American law, we've spent most of our time and energy on state action, right? Um, most of our jurisprudence is focused on um, you know, either limiting, circumscribing, or, you know, understanding state action, and not nearly as much on inaction, right? You'll see it, right? There's like the doctrine of silence and contracts law, and things like that. And I think that points to, again, who does it affect, right? Who's affected by, um, you know, uh, circumscribing state power, and who's affected by states not acting, or states not acting to protect. Um, and I think in order to really um, support all communities, including immigrants, um, you know, Asian Americans, including, you know, um, different marginalized communities, we really, that's, that's, I think, a place that we can start to address, right, the lack or sort of dearth of attention on this area. And, and by dearth of attention, there are lots of human rights lawyers who focused on this area. I don't mean to say that it doesn't exist at all, but just that we, um, I think in the United States, just really emphasize the state action portion. And then we're left flat footed, right? When something like the pandemic happens and there's just unexpected, just complete lack of action. Um, and I think it's not surprising that it was sort of easier for um, a lot of human rights lawyers and international lawyers to sort of see, well, I can see exactly what's going on here because it, we've seen that dynamic play out in other places, just maybe not so much in the United States. So, um, so I guess this is a call for sort of thinking about both sides of this power and, um, and not sort of prioritizing one over the other, but thinking about how both of them work. Uh, Sandy, may I add something to that? I noticed a question about how do you protect the United States from threats from abroad? And that's, uh, that's not, a, that is a very relevant question. And I hope that the, the point about a system of separation of powers is this. First, uh, this is not our first rodeo. Um, the lists of cases in which the government lawyers have lied to the Supreme Court of the United States about the need to invoke national security should give us pause. And the notion that when the executive branch protects the realm from outside military force that the law has to be silent was firmly rejected uh, in the 1600s by Lord Cook in a noble statement when the king attempted to say that his right to conduct military operations was not subject to control by the courts. And Lord Cook said, and I think this is a foundation of the separation of powers of the Constitution, in case our questioner is an originalist, God send me never to live under the law of conveniency or discretion. For if the soldier and the justice sit on the same bench, the trumpet will not let the crier speak in Westminster Hall. Now, Interestingly enough, you go back to Marbury versus Madison, which is the first, you get that in the first semester of law school, Chief Justice Marshall said that the right of judicial review against that of what the government is doing is a, very, is a quite fundamental one. And very early in the court's history, just Thomas Jefferson's first appointee to the Supreme Court held that Jefferson's national security policy uh, imposing an embargo on the port of Charleston was unlawful, uh, saying that national security be damned, that's what the law is. And when Jefferson had his attorney general write an op-ed criticizing uh, Justice Johnson, Justice Johnson fired back with an even more powerful opinion. That case is called Gilchrist versus Collector of Customs. In short, this notion of protecting the country is, is real and the framers of the constitution appreciated it. They also appreciated what's being talked about today. And that is to say the right of people whose rights are at stake to have some form of redress. Sorry, my 4th of July speech. <laughs>
No, it's very good. <laughs> very insightful. Um, we have another question. Um, within the United States, has it ever been deemed legal to, a priori, survey more extensively or give away less privacy rights to the undocumented? Well, who's, who's going to speak first? Um, if, if you are charged with a crime, then your rights under the Fourth Amendment, as if you're undocumented, are the same as everybody else's. And that's irrespective of the offense with which you're charged. Now, as now, we've already talked about what happens to you at the border. The right to control your border, the right of information uh, obtaining there may be greater. But um, the, that issue, um, th there was a case in the Supreme Court, Ivanov versus United States, involving espionage. So you had this person who clearly was undocumented. He was a Soviet um, spy. And... Um, uh, Justice Harlan asked that question, you know, are you saying that the Fourth Amendment means that the spy will go free? And Edward Bennett Williams answered, well, you have to recognize espionage has the lowest recidivism rate of any federal felony, but, um, which I thought was a good answer. But the second answer was that the Fourth Amendment does not know any uh, boundaries in that sense. Wait a minute. Does, it, does anyone else have something to add? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, one footnote. The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act does provide more extensive uh, surveillance uh, uh, with respect to uh, persons who are not citizens of the United States. But theoretically, the Fourth Amendment continues to apply. That's a whole separate inquiry. Do any panelists have anything to add to what Michael said? Okay. Um, there's another question. Um, can, can the panelists talk a little bit about the privacy rights as they exist or not related to genetics that neither appear to be adequately protected by federal laws like GINA, G-I-N-A, or HIPAA, nor by state laws? So I, I, I can start by noting, I think one of the um, one of the things I think we need to think about with privacy rights is that, and then this is um, a segue into what's happening in the area of genetics, is that there's privacy rights in the area where somebody is trying to force you to give up information. Um, and then there's a different set of legal obligations when you've voluntarily provided that information in the first place, right? And I think um, we're all in a situation right now when it comes to privacy, where most people, you know, either intentionally, but probably mostly unintentionally have already released all of this information into the public domain, or at least provided it to different um, corporations or institutions. And, um, and I think that's the case with genetics, right? Most of the you know, a lot of the information on genetics that any group of people is going to have access to is the voluntary 23andMe test that people are doing on their own, right? And putting on these databases that can be access accessed by other people. I know that there are limits on how that information is shared, but again, sort of that, that I want to go back to my focus on the point at which you share information and the point at which you get it back, right? That um, once you've shared that information with somebody, um, stopping the spread of it from entity to entity is a different analysis than sharing it in the first place, right? And I think we need to think about those two frameworks. Professor Rana, may I ask a question about this of you? The, the idea, genetic information, as soon as you say genetic information in the context of marginalized peoples, uh, images of Germany in the 1930s spring immediately to mind. I mean, let's be as well as the eugenics experiments uh, taking place at various times in the United States. So what does 
given the experience of the Holocaust and given the experience of these eugenics experiments in Southern states, particularly in the United States, and given Justice Holmes' stupid remark about in that uh, Buck versus Bell, uh, what does international law have to say about the collecting, storing, using that kind of information? I think we're way, um, we're, we're very much out of compliance with the, I, the international law standards for collecting and sharing this information. Um, I don't even think we're, we're close, right? We're just starting to sort of incrementally regulate from the bottom up, whereas the international human rights standards are that you protect from the top down or you protect holistically, you protect the person and the person's dignity, not little pieces of information here and there. And I would add to what you said um, of sort of the uses in the Holocaust and the eugenics movement. We've also seen things like the case of Henrietta Lacks, right? That genetic information will be taken from someone without their consent and used in um, medical procedures or you know, the, you know, the advancement of science or something, but her cells were being used um, as a form of therapy. I, I don't know the details of the science part of it, but without her consent, her, her cells were being used in all these different ways, right? Um, you know, and, and I think you can find roots to some of that, right? In the um, experiments mm -hmm. with the Holocaust. And so, you know, we already know of some of the worst possible outcomes. And we already know that there have been attempts to do the same thing in the United States. You mentioned eugenics. Um, I'm in Indiana, again, that is not a Southern state. Um, it was a leader in the eugenics movement and in fact passed the first um, forced sterilization law in the United States in 1906 or 1907, right? So, so we know that given the opportunity um, that, uh, you know, there's many people who would abuse this information, right? And I think that where it's difficult to um, address these issues with human rights law right now is that we're not just talking about state entities at this point in time, we're also talking about private entities like corporations that are collecting information. And we're used to, you know, human rights law applies broadly and would apply to different entities, but we're used to applying it in a very government to government format, right? Or, or the, the dynamics of governments working with other governments to address something. We're not used to really applying it in the situation of corporate action um, and so that's another gap that I think needs to be bridged. Okay, um, moving to the, ne the next question. Um, what are the biggest threats we as citizens and as well as undocumented people um, encounter from daily state surveillance? For example, police cameras, street cameras, et cetera. Um, so somebody, somebody will have to speak up, but um, the, the use of such cameras uh, has become a regular feature of streets in many countries in Europe. And the extent to which such things as cameras and facial recognition technology and number plate identification and so on is being, will be litigated and has been litigated before the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, so that would be the first place you'd start to look. Um, this is a, and all I can say is this is a tricky Fourth Amendment area because uh, the government claims that the surveillance is, well, it's everybody. You're just walking down the street. You're exhibiting behavior that anybody can see. What's the difference when there's a camera? Now, one of the things that became clear after uh, September 11, 2001 is that law enforcement agencies leapt on this asserted uh, neutrality of observation and began to mask the use of such technology as a method of collecting evidence with respect to uh, particular offenses, which brings you right into standing to assert Fourth Amendment violations. That's where you get the Supreme Court cases on tracking your cell phone, putting a, a, a tracker on your car and all of these other things. The frontiers of the Fourth Amendment are being explored by the Supreme Court uh, with respect to that issue. And just, uh, you know, pick up your criminal procedure treatise and make sure you look at the pocket parts. If pocket parts still exist, I don't know whether they do or not anymore. Um, 
And I just want to add to that, that, um, you know, I, I think this idea, you mentioned neutrality again, and I think that's really important in this context. So, so I can't say what the biggest threat is that we face, right? There's, there's so many, I think it'll be different for different people. But one thing I think we really need to think about as a threat is that the way that we're implementing surveillance and we're implementing technology is that we're taking this opportunity to start fresh or start new, right? To use these really innovative new technologies. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is that we're applying the frameworks and um, biases of the past in a way that now embeds them in these new systems that are supposed to be so innovative, right? So when we look at um, you know, police cams, you know, street cams, things like that. What we're finding out is that they're trained on old databases that no one has thought about how they might be biased. Um, we know that they can't um, deal with skin color very well, right? That they're much better at, um, you know, identifying um, people who are white than people of color, right? And that they're, the danger of misidentification is really high. So, so what are we doing? We're, we're taking kind of the worst of our past we are not thinking about it at all. We're pretending that data is neutral and we're stuffing it into our paradigms for the future. And you know, we, we also know that technology is ubiquitous. And so what might've been a fourth amendment interaction between one person and a police officer you know, 20 years ago or 40 years ago now is something that can be embedded in these different systems and algorithms and the data that's, you know, that, that's being fed into all of these things and kind of spun out all over the place in so many different contexts. It's no longer this one interaction you have to worry about. It's where is it going to, where, where are these biases and this bad information that went into this, this bad input, in, input where is it going to pop out next, right? Is anybody going to scrub these databases and start fresh with like more, um, you know, data that's been collected with an eye towards equality, like probably not, right? So much money has been spent putting them together in the first place. So I think that's another big picture um, threat that we need to worry about and think about. Could I ask a question of uh, Mr. Gill about uh, uh, your, you, your company makes a product that's directed at a certain demographic. Is that, would that's that be fair to say? That, that okay. would be correct, Michael. All right, now. Um, so, Manjit, uh, does, is, does your company manage to collect information that would tend to identify groups of people that match that demographic to which your product is aimed? And just give us a hint, how do you triage the information that you're getting from all these sources uh, to be able to do that? Because I tell you, I'm getting a lot. Of, I'm getting a lot of ads for things that look like they're stuff that people think I might want. <laughs> Actually, to your point, Michael, you know, depending on, you know, for example, well, let's say if, if we're running a promotion, a sweepstakes or whatnot, for those, depending on also where we're running it, sometimes it's within the U.S., sometimes it's in a foreign country. We go by what what the given country's laws allow us to ask about. You know, in, in certain countries, for example, we, we actually are more limited in what kind of information we can even collect, you know, from the standpoint of having would-be contestants in, a, in, a, in whatever promotion we're running. But for sort of the baseline tends to be, you know, name, name rank, and serial number. In terms of true demographics, Michael, we're not even in a position really to get into, I mean, gender, yes. You know, that, that's typically one we will, depending again on the promotion. For example, even though we sell energy drinks, we also have apparel lines. So obviously with an apparel scenario, you know, you're going to ask, you know, are you a male or are you a female? And then, you know, to an extent with some of the stuff we have are geared for children. So there are dynamics like that. And another area where it does come up for us, tying back into the promotional aspect is we have a lot of what we do in terms of promotions, both here in the US and abroad, is tied into this whole notion of, in the context of social media with what are called influencers. And with that, we actually have influencers that some that are, you know, as young as 13 years old, depending on our product. And, you know, so with, because of that, when we're, you know, getting information, sometimes we need to have their parents involved with actually providing consent. So. It's, you know, obviously it's not, it, it's not a one size fits all and it's, a, it's, it's truly dynamic. We have to always be aware from the legal aspect, you know, supporting our business unit 
to make sure we have a sense of educating them that, okay, if we're going to have influencers in country X, we have to be completely mindful of the law in that country as to you know, what information we can gather, uh, how we're supposed to store it. You know, it, 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 it's, it's a never ending uh, game of fun over here in that regard. So if, if you wanted to expand privacy protection, yes, you would study the laws of different countries, for instance, what the European Union is Absolutely. doing. If you wanted to be if you wanted to be a reformer and protect yourself from the imprecations of energy drink makers, um, <laughs> you'd, uh, you'd, you'd that's that's where you would go. So now there's an opportunity for the lawyers listening to do some law reform. <laughs> So um, there's a question about um, data leaks, um, like the Facebook mm. user data leak um, or LinkedIn data leak. Mm. Um, so the mm. question for the panelists is whether surveillance, um, I guess in your opinion, is more dangerous um, or private data leaks or yeah, data leaks as a result of um, private, private um, actors. Well, in terms of the latter, that's something that we deal with, as I mentioned earlier, from time to time. For, we've been fortunate so far that it's not ever been a whole, you know, a, a tremendous leak, if you will. In, in certain instances, we've been able to cabinet, you know, from the standpoint that it's, you know, a, a discrete uh, number of accounts in terms of information. And, you know, uh, again, you know, for us in the private sector, in terms of the commercial sector, the key, you know, takeaway is that we always stress from a legal standpoint to our business units, listen, even if you'd like to collect everything under the sun about an individual, don't, you know, so that's, you know, where I tend to come in that when they're, you know, looking at collecting information, I, I have to remind them of, you know, the, the dangers of this, that we need to have the mindset, you know, that, uh, just collect the bare minimum. That's one of those things, you know, you know as the lawyer in-house that even though I, I serve one business, I, I still have to be doing it in a, in a manner that protects the business. So sometimes you have to protect them from themselves. But may I say that a, a data leak can affect your pocketbook because they can steal that. A governmental surveillance can affect your democracy and your livelihood. Uh, anybody who's ever lost a job as a result of government collecting information from all sorts of unreliable sources, and I'm, that's happened to me, um, would, uh, would understand that. Again, you go back to those cases, the loyal security cases in the 50s and 60s, and see how the impact even then of the primitive data collection techniques that were being used can be on... Uh, people's right to pursue a livelihood, people's right to participate in politics. Uh, and just, just to add to that, I think that was really powerful. Now we're in a situation where you can have um, private data collected or information that's disseminated that amplifies state power, right? So you think mm -hmm. about Facebook and how they're spreading, helping spread misinformation that's been leading to genocide and sort of circling back to what you raised earlier, Michael, right, about um, sort of what, what ultimately is sort of the most horrific uses of this. And I think never before have states really had the ability to amplify um, the either, the, I think the misuse of data as well as the data they've collected or that others have collected um, in the ways that we have now, right? Unfortunately, technology has, I think, made those opportunities possible. Wow. Okay, um, we're nearing the end of this. Um, if the panelists have any closing remarks uh, for the for the audience, well, I, I want to I want to thank the other participants here. Um, you know, we are we are at a frontier here. We are attempting to devise ways to protect what we understand to be rights to privacy and to political participation and so on, and facing these challenges created by unregulated technology, recognizing that these things impact most on marginalized communities. So uh, for all the lawyers listening, um, and especially you law students, uh, there's there's your homework assignment. 
us your call to action, I think. And I just wanted to add thank you both to the panelists and moderator, the people who put this together and everybody in the audience who's been asking these um, really provocative questions. Um, and I also wanna say, I think it's great that we brought people from so many different areas, um, you know, practice areas and focuses together. And I think that's important as we go forward, right? To have this intermingling of ideas. Um, well, I do want to thank everyone for joining us for this free webinar. Um, we encourage you to check out the other webinars in the Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month series, web series. There's a link to the web series um, page in the chat where you can find additional information on these programs. We'd like to express our gratitude to this esteemed group of panelists. You're all doing such critical work, and we thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to share your experiences. The section of civil rights and social justice provides free webinars and resources for legal professionals and advocates nationwide. We hope this helps you find, we hope this helps you in your work. And again, if you can, please consider joining and becoming an active member of the American Bar Association. You may do so at ambar.org slash CRSJ. Best of luck in your work and stay safe everyone. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>